Hello everyone, and welcome to another video of the Attack Reviews. So we just published a review for the 11700K, and here comes its bigger brother, 11900K. Unlike the previous generation, the i9 flagship has exactly the same specs as the i7 11700K. Actually, Eva has a slightly lower base clock, 3.5 GHz compared to 3.6 on the 11700K. However, what makes it an i9 is the turbo velocity boost, and a new Intel Adaptive Boost. So we already know how the Turbo Velocity Boost works. As long as you have adequate cooling, the i9 processor will boost its frequency for an extra 100 megahertz. And we'll talk about the Intel Adaptive Boost later. But apart from those two, it is the same chip as the 11700K. Same core count, same thread, same cache, same PCIe support, and same iGPU. The reason this review is taking so long is because of the new Intel ABT, or Adaptive Boost technology. So basically what it does is that it will override the Turbo Boost 2 or Turbo Boost 3 multiplier limit, and it gives a higher all-core boost given there's enough thermal and power budget. So long story short, it will give the 11900K an all-core boost of 5.1 GHz under ideal conditions compared to the 4.8 default. ASUS just released a new BIOS update that supports the Intel ABT, so that's why I have to redo all the tests. In this review, we'll first take a look at the processor without the ABT enabled, and then compare the improvement ABT brings. And after that comes the important part. Can it beat a LTT GOAT sample 11900K? Let's find out. A disclaimer on the 5800X score. The AIO I'm using does not have AM4 amount bracket, so these scores are tested with a cheap air cooler. So with the limited thermal budget, it is not achieving the max PBO frequencies, and that's why it's getting lower than usual scores. A lot of viewers has pointed that out. I don't have the 5800X on hand right now, so I cannot retest it. It is not that I intentionally lowered the score for AMD to make Intel look better. Obviously, Intel did not sponsor this review, and myself is using a 5900X while writing this. So, it is completely due to the limitation of testing equipment. The point of this review, however, is not Intel versus AMD anyways, so it shouldn't be too big of a problem. If you really want to know how 11900K stands against AMD, I will include a little bit of 5900X score in the final part of this review so you can get an idea. Firstly, let's take a look at CPU-C. Thanks to the higher boost clock and the presence of thermal velocity boost, it is slightly faster than 11700K, but only by a tiny margin. In IDA64 memory testings, it is pretty much the same as the 11700K. Next is Cinebench. In Cinebench R15, again, it's almost the same as 11700K. It is technically higher, but it's within a margin of error. And Cinebench R20, the difference is a little bigger than R15. It is about 100 points, which is about 2% faster. And it's about 6% faster in single core. And V-Ray, again, it has a higher average clock speed of 4.68 GHz compared to 4.55 on the 11700K. But the result is only 200 points higher, which is only about 1.2%. In Blender, we tested both Classroom and BMW. It is 4 seconds faster in BMW and 28 seconds faster in Classroom. In 7-Zip, it is about 3% faster in decompression while being almost within a margin of error in compression. In Handbrake, we're transcoding a 1 minute and 31 seconds 4K video into 1080p H.264. It is 3 seconds faster, which is about 4%. In Geekbench 5, it is 5% faster in single core and 2% faster in multi core testings. In Y Cruncher, it is only 1 second faster than the 11700K in single thread testings and 11 seconds faster in multi core testings. Next, let's take a look at the games. First is 3D Mark. Let's just focus on the CPU part. Again, they're identical, almost within a margin of error. It actually got slightly lower score than 11700K for some reason. In Hitman 2, again, it's pretty boring. It is basically a 11700K with an legible gain. In Horizon, it is exactly a 11700K. In Shadow of the Tomb Raider, it is even worse than 11700K. 
I actually retest it just to make sure, but I still got the same result. In Dirt 5, it is 2 FPS faster than 11700K. Yeah, I exaggerated the difference, so it looks less boring, but it's really only 2 FPS. Okay, this is kind of boring, right? Let's see what Intel Adaptive Boost technology brings. I just hate it because it made me run all my benchmarks again. Here, I've included a stock 10900K to give you an idea of where 11th generation stands against the 10th generation i9. The reason I did it is simple. It is because ABT makes close to no difference to the performance. But since I spent all this time testing it, so um, I just decided to keep the ABT scores. Otherwise, this whole section should not have existed if I don't add something new to it. So here's the result. It is definitely a lot faster than the 10900K in single-threaded testings, but the 10900K has a win in multi-threaded thanks to its two extra cores. Next is Cinebench R15. Again, ABT makes almost no difference. The 11th generation is faster in single-threaded testings and slower in multi-threaded testings. And it's the same with R20. There's nothing really worth to be talked about. In 7-zip, 10900K is faster in decompression while a little bit slower in compression. In Blender, 10th gen and 11th gen performs almost the same. Again, ABT doesn't help in any way. Why Cruncher is where the 11th generation and the ABT actually shines, because it uses AVX512 instructions, which is lacking on the 10th gen. The 10900K is a lot slower than the 11th generation in this case. In V-Ray, ABT makes no difference, and 10900K is still faster thanks to extra cores, but not by a whole lot. In 3D Mark Time Spy, the 11th generation is about 20% faster than the 10th generation in CPU score. ABT only gives it about 1% gain on 11900K. Okay, that's still boring, right? Now it's time to do something interesting. Let's overclock both of them and see how they compete. For the 10900K, I'm using the LTT Gold sample, which is a bundle of Cherry Pick 10900K and a Cooler Master ML360 Sub Zero cooler. Technically, it should give excellent overclocking result, so let's give it a try. Okay, here we're in the BIOS. ASUS gives it a 109 SP score, which is high, but not the highest I've ever seen on a 10900K. It is predicting that it will need 1.398 volts at L4 LLC to run non-AVX workloads at 5.3 GHz. Okay, let's start from that and see how it performs. With the cooler, we need to install the cryo software and it makes it work in cryo mode. So the cooler will communicate with the processor and adjust the cooling in real time. We'll make a separate video on this, so if you want to know more about this set, please subscribe so that you won't miss it. So right now we can see at idle, the cooler is pulling about 100 watts of power from the 8-pin connector, and the CPU temp is around 22 degrees. Let's open HW Info 64 monitor, and here we can see the processor is running at 5.3 GHz on old core. The VID is actually a little higher at 1.44 volts, but VID only means what the CPU thinks it needs at a given frequency. It's not the actual frequency that's being fed to it. And the temps are in the lower 20 degrees range, which is pretty cool. Now let's roll on some R20 and see if we can get a pass. Keep in mind, R20 actually uses AVX instructions, so it will normally require higher voltage. And we got a pass. We got 62.52 points. Uh, if you take a closer look at the result, it is still slower than our 5.3 GHz old core 11700K we tested last time. But that's not the full potential of the Go sample. Let's try something extreme. So let's put 5.5 GHz on 4 cores and 5.4 GHz on 6 cores and see how CPU Z score looks like. Okay, now we're getting over 8,000 points for multi threaded and 651 points for single threaded. It is very remarkable score under non LN2 cooling. So let's try V Ray. And no. It cannot pass V-Ray. But will it pass Cinebench R20? Uh, no, it's a freeze. Okay, now we have restarted and let's lower the frequency a little bit. 
that's to 5.4 gigahertz on four cores and 5.3 on the other six cores. And it still freezes while running R20. So after some tweaking, the most reasonable combination factoring the temperature, voltage, and performance I can get is 5.3 gigahertz all core if we're running AVX workloads. And our 11900K is not as highly bent as the 10900K. It has a SP score of 71 in BIOS. And a BIOS is predicting it needs 1.6 volts to reach 5.3 gigahertz all core for non-AVX workloads. However, when we apply 1.6 volt to it, it thermal throttles immediately even with a cryo cooler. So after some tweaking, the best combination for this particular chip running AVX workload is all core 5.2 GHz at 1.52 volts. And here are the results. In CPU-Z, the 10900K is still 1000 points faster than the 11900K thanks to its extra two cores. But in single core performance, the 11900K is about 10% faster than the 10th generation. In R20, it's the same situation. The 11900K is slightly slower in all core performance, but definitely have a lead on single core. In V-Ray, they're almost the same, with 10900K being 4 points faster. So, conclusion. I have very mixed feelings about Rocky Lake processors now. Yes, the 11700 non-K version and the 11500 non-K version, which we're currently reviewing, are a very competitive choice at a respective price point. But for 11900K, I'm not too sure. I mean, it's at a price range of a 5900X, which is 12 cores. So in Intel's defense, it is able to achieve roughly same old core performance with two less physical cores on the same manufacturing node, which is the biggest breakthrough for Intel in the past few years. However, being at the same price point, an overclocked 11900K can't even see the tail light of the 5900X. So, trying to be competitive at mid-range and completely give up on high-end market. Does that sound familiar to you? Yes, this was the position AMD has been in for almost a decade before Ryzen. So, what should I say? Good job Intel on Rocky Lake. It is the highest IPC gain in the past few years. And on the other hand, you really need to do better than this. Upcoming will be a review of the Intel middle ground chip of the Rocky Lake, which is 11500. Again, it's a very solid choice for its price point, so please stay tuned on that. Alright, that's it for today's video. If you liked the video, please hit the like button and subscribe. Thanks for watching.